Hi Moonies, welcome to the Sailor Moon Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria L. Johnson, aka Miss Old School, and I'm here with L.L. McKinney. She's the author of the Nightmare Verse series, which includes A Blade So Black, A Dream So Dark, and at least two more upcoming novels, including the next book in the series, which is called A Crown So Cursed, and the prequel. And she's coming out with a novel that she describes as a black gamer girl love letter to Sailor Moon, which means that she's a Sailor Moon fan. She also has a new biographic novel coming out, a Black Widow serial coming out in June through Serial Box, and she's contributed to three anthologies. So basically, she's killing it in this author game, and I'm so happy to have her on the podcast. Welcome to the Sailor Moon Fan Club, Elle. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, and I'm really excited and very busy, (laughs) as you you said. Very, very, very busy, but like also all amazing things. It's pretty awesome. If I were to tell, like, younger Elle, hey, you wouldn't just be doing books, you'd be doing all this other stuff, she would be thrilled, so. Mm -hmm. So, first question, since this is a Sailor Moon fan club podcast, what's your first memory of watching Sailor Moon? My first memory of Sailor Moon is late elementary school, early middle school. It used to come on in the mornings when I was getting ready, and I would have to tape it on VHS to catch some of the episodes because it came on right when, like, hey, you can watch 15 minutes of it and then you have to run out the door. So I remember the dub. I don't remember which episode I saw first. I just know that it was on something for kids and there was this very loud screaming bulldog general (laughs) that would say, hey, we'll be back. You know how they used to do when commercials were a thing. And then they're like, back to the show or whatever. So those are my- Don't touch that remote. (laughs) Yes. Those are my earliest, earliest memories of Sailor Moon. Wow. And how did you feel? What were you thinking when you saw it the first time? You know, it's been- 25 plus years of just love and just awe almost. It's been all mixed together. But I remember thinking this is the coolest thing on the planet. Like these are (laughs) girls who go to school and then they transform. Because, you know, magical girl transformations weren't super prominent if they were even a thing before Sailor Moon. I know that the whole, oh, what do they call? There were transformations because uh, Power Rangers or Sentai Warriors or whatever had been around and they do their thing. But this was the first time when I saw it and I was like, this is this, this is just pretty damn cool. Like, but I was like, this is, this is honestly the coolest thing ever. And I remember I had tapes of the episodes, but there was one tape that I would make that just had everybody's transformations and all of their their attacks. Honestly, was just, I don't know, little Elle was blown away that this was a thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, they, sometimes I still like watch the YouTube videos and they just show all of their transformations and all of their attack. And it's just so, I mean, I know it's a magical girl genre, but like magic, it feels like the only word to describe it just yeah. like captures you. Do you have a, a favorite Sailor Scout? My favorite Sailor Scout is Sailor Uranus. Sailor Uranus was just, I don't know. She, she came onto the scene and she was on screen And she was just this whole, just this badass who raced cars and drove motorcycles. And she was the one in my head. I'm like, oh, she wears the boys school uniform. And she was just the coolest. And then she would do her transformation. And then she was, you know, right there with the rest of them in the skirt and the heels and just doing all the pretty magical girl stuff. And for me, (laughs) it was like that, that right there, it reconciled, you know, tomboyish L and whatnot, who still occasionally like to, you know, put on the dress and be pretty and whatnot. So she, she just, she was really one that captivated me from like immediately. I can totally see that because you like serve some looks on, Instagram and Twitter with the makeup and I'm like I need to <laughs> get like you <laughs> it's very it's it's that comes from having a literal beauty queen as a sister who 
sat down and was like, okay, so here's the thing. All this, and she would like gesture at my face <laughs> and my unblended makeup and my too heavy <laughs> blush. And she's like, no, no. If if we're going to do anything, <laughs> we're going to do it right. So it's from that was the initiative and then, you know, years of practice. And so now it's it's pretty um almost second nature to get up and throw a face on. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Awesome. You give me hope. I think I'm like almost there. Almost. She <laughs> does some incredible stuff. I will probably never be able to do, but again, <laughs> literal beauty right. queen. Awesome. 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 So Sailor Moon, like 20 plus years ago, but now fast forward, you write or you come up with the nightmare verse, which is the Alice in Wonderland inspired series. How did that come about? Well, I, I've told this story uh, a few times, and it's always fun to tell because I had originally, it's Alice is the fourth or fifth book that I wrote intended to be published, but it was the first Black girl book that I wrote. And all because all the other books were about white boys, because that's what I read, and I thought that's what you had to write to be published. And so when I finally wrote Alice, it was like I was giving myself permission to be the hero. And it was like, this is a main character. It's science fiction and fantasy, which are genres that I love. I'm a huge geek. So she's going to be the same. And what is one of the things that she's going to do is cosplay. And what does she cosplay? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's going to be Sailor Moon, among other things that I love, you know, because she does other stuff. But Sailor Moon was the first anime that I fell in love with before I even knew what anime was and it's so iconic and it just ended up being part of it naturally because again I had given myself permission to put pieces of myself into the hero so that's part of Alice that's part of me it was like if if I'm gonna be this girl who's running around stabbing monsters kicking ass flipping over things fighting it's gonna be exactly what I envisioned when I was younger. Mm-hmm. So that's how that came about. Yeah, because I love to, like, as I was reading it, Alice, she cosplays as Princess Serenity and she shouts moon cosmic power. Yes. <laughs> Whenever she tries, like, to kill basically, like, the black hole where the monsters, which are called nightmares, come out of. I think, yeah, it's just like little things like that I thought were so cool that you're able to put a little bit of your fandom into this book. It's totally something that I would do, like, if. I got superpowers today, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? Right. I would be shouting lines from my favorite heroes and Sailor Moon and gang is one of them. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I've, there's definitely been many times where I have not had powers when I was younger and like tried to transform. So I know if I definitely had powers, it would be a thing. I have many a time spun in circles and fallen over dizzy as a kid. Oh, yeah. 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 We're running around. Fourth of July and New Year's when they gave us fireworks? Man, that was it. (laughs) Like, I'm holding sparklers. You bet every single power Mm -hmm. was shouted at the top of my lungs. (laughs) That's amazing. Um, That's great. And the other one, too, I realized you put a lot of them. Or some Buffy references in there, too. I didn't realize you're also a Buffy fan, which makes sense. But, yeah. Yes, I am a Buffy fan. Uh, not as much as I am a Sailor Moon fan. Like I, I watched the Buffy series when it was on, and it came on TV. And then I watched the spinoff Angel when it was on. I have not seen every single episode because it wasn't one of those I have to sit down for this week's episode type deals for me. But if it was on, I was happy to watch it, and I didn't like seek it out or anything. But you know, I'm channel surfing i'm like oh angel's on let me settle in and watch uh oh buffy's on so it's it's one of those that i paid attention to plus it was like everybody loved it so you even if you didn't watch it you kind of knew what was going on it's kind of like harry potter is now i very rarely run into anybody who doesn't know who or what harry potter is even if they've never seen or read a book that's very true i feel like it's probably the same thing for like game of thrones or like you kind of know the characters but even if you haven't watched it you kind of know things yeah. and who people hate and all that stuff yeah, like yeah you could point at pictures and funny. be like they hate that kid that's the girl right. with the dragons <laughs> i don't know who he mm-hmm. is but i know he's from game of thrones it's kind of the same thing right yeah 
But like just imagining the twins as two spikes is just really funny. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then, I mean, the descriptions in this book are just phenomenal. One of my favorite parts is when Alice comes across her best friend's Courtney's sister, Crystal, and she's dressed up as a Slytherin from Harry Potter. And then, but she has like a lightning bolt on her head. And I was so confused. And then she's like, Oh, are you Harry Potter? And she's like, Yeah, if he chose right. And like in this, that little exchange, you learn so much about Crystal. Yeah. I thought that was just like really clever. And just, I guess my question is, how did you get so good at writing and like creating like these descriptions? <laughs> That's funny because like every author is going to be like, Oh, there are like these, all these people over here that are that much better. But I will say that this is going to be more geekiness. I. Back when they had like Yahoo chat rooms and live journal was a thing and so forth and so on. I uh, RP'd a lot. And Sailor Moon was one of the shows that I RP'd at. And I had my original characters and then I role played some of the actual characters. And so when you have one person that you're maybe bouncing back and forth with, or if you're in a group setting and there are multiple people who are involved in whatever shenanigans is going on. There's a lot of narrative because you have to describe what's going on and you don't want to be boring, but you don't want to like not have enough details. People aren't asking questions. You want it to be smooth. So Mm -hmm. honestly, years and years of role playing is kind of how I cut my teeth because I didn't really do much of the fan fiction scene. Like I, I did some early on before I even knew what fan fiction was. I did some unintentional fan fiction when I thought I was actually writing my own story because, I mean, magical girl transformations and princesses from other planets and things like that. It it was very clearly influenced by Sailor Moon (laughs) as much as I wanted it to not be. But yeah, I mean, lots of writers say that they got started with fan fiction. Mine was role play. That makes so much sense. My brother, he's... Be it, he's been a DM for you know Dungeons and Dragons a few times and just seeing him like prepare and like think of like stories and things to put together and how he's going to portray it like I can see how that would like exercise those muscles to like become a better writer. It it helps a whole lot because you have to inhabit characters that you know don't belong to you, but maybe you give them those additional twists that you can maybe hint at. But most of it was having to do with world setting and setting the scene and progressing a storyline that you only had half the knowledge of, or maybe a third or the fourth of the knowledge about. Because if you're with a group of people, five or more, you're only one fifth of the storytelling catalyst. So you know your character and what they'll do, but you have no idea what's going to happen with anybody else, really. So... The storytelling is very organic in that way, which is probably why I don't plot very much. I'm a pantser, so I'll vomit this idea that I have, and it'll be, you know, however many thousands of words. And then after I get it all out, I then go back and extract a outline and a plot from that, shape it up, and then go back and redo everything. So RP has had a very, very distinct effect on my writing style. Awesome. Do you remember any of your original characters? Oh, man. There was one Sailor Scout that I role played. She was a uh, one of she was a starlight, an extra starlight mm. because the planets were taken. Right. Right. <laughs> and I forget <laughs> what stars. her name yeah. was, but she was fun. And I made some original characters for. Harry Potter, of course. There was some original characters for Pirates of the Caribbean because that was a thing. Oh, man. Not really. I I played original characters, but I mostly played characters that already existed. I had this, not really a superpower, but if I was with friends and they were like, hey, we need somebody to play this character, they would tap me and be like, hey, can you do this? And I'd be like, all right, give me 24 hours. And I would go and I would read the wiki page or I don't even know if Wikipedia was a thing or it was kind of a budgeting thing at the time. So I would go and I would read up on the character and I would come back and I would be able to play that character to a T. 
having never read or watched or whatever. And a lot of people were like, I don't know how you do this, but you've done it yet <laughs> again. So I, I was there to fill in mm-hmm. when needed. That's so cool. Hmm. Awesome. And then without giving away too many spoilers, what can we expect next with A Crown Slip Cursed? Well, A Crown Slip Cursed is going to be the final installment of this first trilogy. I don't think it'll be the last time that I visit. Well, I know for a fact it's not going to be the last time that I visit this world because there's a prequel coming out. But I also don't think it's the last time I'll visit these characters either because it's just so vast and so much has happened over such a long period of time. But with the Crown So Chris itself, we'll be wrapping up some of the more pertinent questions like, who did this? Or how did that happen? And just sort of drawing everything to a close with Alice's attachments and relationships and things that have arisen thanks to, you know, the Black Knight showing up in book one and this new poet showing up in book two and book three is just a culmination of things that you know people dealing with stuff that they thought was happening but it turned out to be a lie or the lie turned out to be true i know this is all very very vague but again (laughs) uh no spoilers right i feel like if you read the book you'll understand and if you haven't you should (laughs) Or that you'll, you'll so at least be intrigued to, to, read. to talk mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. the story this far into it because it's one of those things where it's like the first book has been out for almost two years now. I should be able to say stuff, right? But at the same time, <laughs> yeah, there'll be new readers once the third book comes out, uh huh. Would assume, and then of course in the future. And then so Lionsgate is also adapting it. Is there anything you can tell us about that? I don't know. Uh, there isn't anything I can really say about it, for one, because these industries are so secretive with so much stuff. But at the same time, nobody has to tell you anything, which is something that I don't think a lot of people realize is that when someone sells the rights to the TV or film for something, then that's the end of it. Like, legally, that's the end of it. That's that's as far as they have to be involved. I've read where some writers will sell their TV or movie rights and then they don't know anything until the public knows. They have no say in anything. And then when they go see it, they are just as surprised as everybody else. Then you have some people who were very involved because the the producers and studio wanted them to be involved. So it's all up to the producer and the studio. So things could be happening and I'm just completely not aware of it because I don't need to be pertinent to those emails until we get to a point where they either want me to or need me to for whatever reason. So I don't know. I'm guessing and poking around in the dark along with anyone else, everyone else. So, you know, we can all hope and wish for good things all together because I am right there with you. Yeah. Well, thank you for the, the breakdown. I feel like I'm included, like just don't know how these things work. So it's always nice to get a peek behind the curtains. You can say And then you also have, as I mentioned before, the Black Girl Gamer Love Letter to Sailor Moon coming out. Um, How much can you say about that? What's that about? Tell me everything you can. Sure. (laughs) Um, So that one is a middle grade. And it's about a 12-year-old girl. She's a Black gamer. And she finds out that she is the reincarnated King Arthur. And so once she finds this out, she has to find her gamer knights who are, some of them are her friends. And then she has to go out and find the others who are also reincarnated so that they can stop Morgana, who is the superintendent of their school district before Morgana enslaves students to, you know, do her evil bidding and her plot to take over the world and blah, blah, blah. And she has to do it with the help of her science teacher who is also Merlin in this case. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited about it. Um, There are transformation sequences, all of that. It's it's pretty much, I don't know, Sailor Moon meets King Arthur kind of, I suppose, would be a way that you could describe it. So it's 
my way of taking everything that I loved about this show and these tropes and then reapplying them into something that's a little bit different because it involves gaming and a little bit of science. I'm not huge with science, but I mean, it's there. Magic. And fighting evil by digital moonlight, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's funny because I never would have put like King Arthur and Sailor Moon together. But like the more you explain it, the more I'm kind of seeing the like where they could like the Venn diagram where they have like similarities, like Merlin kind of being like a Luna figure and like Arthur pulling like the sword out of the stone and, you know, like Sailor Moon getting the scepter, you know. Yes. It's weird because I find because I don't imagine people who would very often think of Buffy and Alice in Wonderland in the same mm-hmm. go. But very you know, true. here it is. So this is gonna be another one of those where it's a retelling, but not, but also yes. I'm really excited to work on it. I honestly cannot tweet. Yeah, I'm excited for you. I'm excited to read it. I'm excited about everything. <laughs> How do you balance like you have Alice in Wonderland, you know, Blades of Black based on Alice or inspired by Alice in Wonderland and the Black Girl Gamer Love Letter to Sailor Moon inspired by King Arthur. Um, how do you balance having something that's inspired by a fairy tale, but also making it so unique at the same time? One of the things for me is that I, they're called retellings, but for me, I like to say reimaginings because I don't aspire to redo any of the story itself. I will pull elements, I will uh, make hints at the original material, but I have no intention of following any of the plot beats. For instance, unless this becomes a series and goes on for a while, I don't have in this first book any indication or inclination to do anything about looking for a holy grail. Like, And that's one of them... Oddly enough, even though it wasn't part of the original canon, that's what most people nowadays associate King Arthur with is the quest for the Holy Grail and blah, blah, blah. That's not going to be part of mine. There's not going to be a lot of the things from his story of going off to this war or sending his knights to do these things. Like I, I just don't ever take into account the plot from the original because my plot is what I'm going to be working on. You know, my focus, my goal with the story. So just being able to borrow things from it help a whole lot. It, it's kind of like if somebody's, you know, is like, hey, here are the ingredients to make spaghetti. And I'm like, cool. And I go off and make pizza because you have the meat and you have the sauce and you have the cheese but I'm not going to use noodles or whatever. I'm going to go over here and find a way to make pizza dough. And while it's going to be in the same uh, family and have some of the same ingredients and the same taste, it's going to be completely different. And so it's going to be a different experience. Hmm. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and then like a lot of these are fairy tales too. So are there any other fairy tales you'd like to ma- reimagine? I would love to do like a Rapunzel. Just because the whole thing with black girls and black people in our hair, um, so hair that her hair is literally magical, uh, so that would be something that I think would be fun. Maybe I would do a fairy tale that's not well known. Well, I can't say not well known. I mean, everybody knows Alice in Wonderland, so I don't know. Mm. But <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. Like, I think Cinderella is one of the ones that has been like done to death. Beauty and the Beast has been done to death. Little Mermaid, I don't know what you could do with that without doing the same story beats. Uh -uh. Well, I am doing a retelling, kind of reimagining of um, Jane Eyre. So there's that. But it's not really a fairy tale, so to speak. Right. So I don't know. I never really set out with this idea of, I'm going to redo these fairy tales. It just (laughs) sort of happened. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you've been doing great. So there's that. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. And then so you're also tapping into graphic novel world, comic book world, You're working on Nubia and a Black Widow serial. How's that coming along? How did that project come about? Are you excited? 
<laughs> I am very excited. Nubia actually came about because it was 2018 and I tweeted, I want to write Young Justice because they were talking about doing a season three and blah, blah, blah. And so I just tweeted about it. And so one of the executives at DC messaged me and was like, hey, let's talk. So during the process of pitching stuff for Young Justice, I brought up Nubia because, in my opinion, she is criminally undervalued and underutilized. Very much so. Or if she's there, she's been just turned into a regular old Amazon. And Amazons are amazing. But when you're Wonder Woman's twin sister, like the only one who could put her on her ass repeatedly, undisputedly, you are stronger than her. I think being regulated to just being Amazon number 342 and, oh, you have a name that kind of calls back to this other person is a crime. So I had planned on sneaking Nubia back into the canon (laughs) via Young Justice, you know, because everybody had these young protégés, the running around, doing the business, whatever. And so the team was like, we like what you're doing with Nubia. Can you pitch us something with that? And so I was like, okay, cool. So I uh, shifted gears. I pitched them Nubia. They loved it. Uh, long story short, I turned in the the um, the final script for that earlier this month. And the artist is currently going through, uh, it's about two thirds of the way through with the pages. And then the colorist will have to go through and do all the coloring. So it's it's a process. And it's one that I think has strengthened my writing a whole lot because you don't do narrative. You have to convey everything via dialogue and dialogue only. And what you need to allow for also is the drawing does a lot of the heavy lifting. And I have no part in that. It it really has helped me hone my skills in dialogue and telling a story because I can't rely on narrative voice or flashbacks the way that you kind of can with your writing prose. So that's how Nubia came about and Black Widow came about. So Twitter, I find, has been <laughs> kind of how I get the hookup in, in the Marvel and DC world. <laughs> with Black Widow, I had somebody reach out to me, hey, you want to work on this thing? And I'm like, hell yeah. Like, is this, I'm not going to say <laughs> yeah. no. So that happened, and I work with a great team of writers uh, for Serial Box, and that comes out June this year. Yeah. Yeah. You busy, as we said. Quite busy. <laughs> that's exciting. And it's a new biographic novel, Black Widow. Super exciting. Do you have any advice for aspiring writers who want to be where you at you're at like super busy doing all the amazing projects you're doing yes i'm going to say the thing that i say all the time or most often is one of the biggest differences between authors who are published and authors who are not is don't give up now there's some nuance there because there's this whole thing with the industry Being ridiculously racist, which it is. So don't give up also has caveats, but don't give up is the main message. And I say this because I started writing with the goal of being published over a decade ago. And the agent that sold Alice wasn't even an agent when I started writing. She didn't become an agent until maybe, I think, a year before I queried her. And by then, I had already been at this for about seven years. So if I had stopped on any of the three, four books that came before Alice, because I had to write them to get better, because each book you write just makes you stronger as a writer, I wouldn't have gotten to Alice. There's no way I could have written Alice without writing those four books first. And then the editor who acquired Alice wasn't in place until six months before we submitted to her because and we started submissions. We were on submissions for two years. So if at any point during that first year and a half, if I, you know, had thrown in the towel, that wouldn't have happened. So the people who were in place for this to happen 
didn't move into that place until much later on. So you never know what's going to happen down the line. If I had given up at any point during that, I wouldn't be where I am right now. And the second bit of advice I would say is put it out there. Social media and such are allowing for people to make connections in ways that wasn't possible beforehand. Mm -hmm. And you see on Twitter or on Instagram where somebody will have a picture of, I tweeted that I was going to do this thing and here I am however many years later doing the thing. No, there's right. there's a power in putting things out into the universe. I pray for stuff, you know, and I always knew that I wanted to be a writer and I just always expected it. I expected it to happen. And because I expected it, I never really accepted no. I accepted not right now, but I never really accepted no. So I fully believe in, you know, putting it out there and whatever you believe in, whatever entity or power, uh, higher power, and don't give up. Those are my main, my main two things. There's a lot more advice, you know, once you get into the nitty gritty, but those are the basic things that I would hang my hat on. That's powerful. And what or who else do you stand? For me, it's like Beyonce, Sailor Moon, Boy Meets World, <laughs> other Let's anime. See. I am a Hey Hey stand. Hey Hey from Moana. I, saw I that feel on that he is the uh, <laughs> unsung hero of that film. I, so much. Of course, Nubia. I've always stayed in Nubia. I'm so happy to be able to add to her mythos. I don't have any people that I stand. I'm huge fans of like Beyonce. And I know this is going to be polarizing, but I love Nickelback. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like Nickelback. <laughs> I have, I've enjoyed Nickelback for a very long time. I couldn't tell you who anyone was except the man, the lead singer. <laughs> and I only know his name because when you look for Hero, the song from the first Spider-Man movie, it's by Chad Kroger and Josie Scott. So the only reason I know his name is because it's not the band Nickelback <laughs> that does that song. Right. It's him. Uh, so <laughs> I stand, but I don't stand, you know, to that degree. I never really thought about it. Yeah, we yeah. stand so many things. He's mentioned you liked other anime too, like like Sailor Moon was the first one he got into. But I'm assuming you've you've had more since. Then. Oh yeah, my top anime is, of course, Sailor Moon. I also love uh, D Gray Man, which I don't know. That anime has done some weird things. Like it went on for like 104 episodes and then it stopped and then it came back without the original voice actors. And you can't do that. <sighs> you really can't. It just throws everything off. It really does. Yeah. And it's not like it's a however many years later reboot. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's less than, if it's going to be less than half, a decade or so, then maybe try a little bit to get the original people. I don't know. I don't know what did or didn't happen. But that's definitely one. I'm a huge fan of Avatar The Last Airbender, which isn't anime, but is anime style. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's anime adjacent. Yes. Yes. Amazing I was series. a huge fan of Voltron until the last few episodes. I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really enjoy Shira right now. Looking forward to the next season of that. Also, Dragon Prince. Yeah, that's and created by the same creators as Avatar: Last and Airbender, I think. Yes, it is, mm-hmm. and it's very. It, it fills the Last Bender shaped hole in my heart somewhat. Because you get to mm-hmm. hear Sokka running around screaming at things and yeah. <laughs> making snide and snippy and hilarious remarks. I also really enjoyed Inuyasha. And although it's not anime, it's just animation. One of my favorite shows is Gargoyles from the 90s. Oh, Gargoyles that show is so good. It's ahead of its time and it holds up very well. Very, very well. Greatly it really enjoyed. does. I, re- I rewatched it in college and I was like, why is this show so good? <laughs> it is so good. It's, mm-hmm. it's amazing. And I'm kind of sad that it ended the way that it, because it didn't really end. It just stopped coming on. And I don't know, the third season sort of went off into this weird social justice almost feel that just, 
you can very much tell that there were people trying to write about a thing that they really didn't have all that much experience in. And so it rang a little bit hollow. The strongest season from Gargoyles is season two. Just going to say that. But it's it's one of my favorite shows. And I need them to remake it while we still have Keith David with us. Because yes, I don't care if you voice. remake it later on. You, No one else can be Goliath. I am sorry. No. Nope, nope, nope. Just he how it is works. the voice. Yeah. Yes. Jordan Peele is voiced interest in like doing something with it. So I hope that happens. Because I feel like he'd be great at it. Yeah. It's it's such a good show. And it was I like the one of the main characters is black and Native American. Like mm-hmm. what? Right. What? A whole family. I don't mm. uh, that that completely for for that time, that was practically yeah. unheard of. And like you black said, people and native character. people were like mm-hmm. regulated to the gimmicky sidekicks. Yeah, if 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 that, <laughs> if that, if you, mm-hmm. you show you right, if that, <laughs> if that, yeah, so yeah, yeah, those that's, are, yeah, those are the things that I stand along with various video games like the Dragon Age series, and mm. I was a huge fan of Overwatch until they decided to be like, hey, we just don't like black women. So hate yeah. it when that happens. Mm. <laughs> so many things I loved, and it's like, oh, you guys don't like black women? Okay, I guess I can't do this anymore. Right. Thanks. That was fun while it lasted. Very much so. (laughs) Yeah. And then, so the last thing, which I asked everyone, is at the end of Sailor Moon, she had a Sailor Moon says phrase that she would like, just general piece of advice or like life advice that she would give. So what would, what would your Sailor Moon be says be? Or your LL McKinney says, your L says, or... Oh, (laughs) (laughs) those little things that would just like recapture the episode. Right, Stay yeah. in school, kids. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> oh man, I don't know. Screw the haters. Secure the bag. Like I love that, it. Perfect. <laughs> that's gonna be it for me. It's like, eh. yeah. No, I mean you can't. You can't give energy to it. So yeah, I think that's perfect. Like screw the negaverse. <laughs> yeah. Screw the haters. Absolutely. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being on the show. This was fun. Thanks for having me. I haven't gotten to be on like a specifically Sailor Moon podcast. And I was like, yes, I will do the thing. Please. Yes. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, there are a few Sailor Moon podcasts out there, but this felt very kind of unique just because like no one talks to like other Sailor Moon fans just about being Sailor Moon fans. And like, yeah, all these awesome people are Sailor Moon fans. So yeah. Sailor Moon has... A grip on popular culture that 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I would not have expected. Yeah, so. me neither. I, for the longest, I thought I was the only one because I always came across other anime fans, but they weren't necessarily like huge Sailor Moon fans. Mm-hmm. But as time has gone on, I'm like, there is a, a group of us out here, a strong group. <laughs> yeah, that's mm-hmm. actually how I met <laughs> My longest running best friend, the one I've known the longest, it was eighth grade. And we were in orchestra and I see her across the room and she's holding something that is Sailor Moon related. And so I walk up to her. And my very first words to her are, you like Sailor Moon too, is this question. And she says, yes. And we have been inseparable ever since. <laughs> and it was Sailor Moon, like spotting this Sailor Moon thing across the room that resulted in me going in. Yeah. No, it's like an instant best friend creator. Like you see someone else with a Sailor Moon anything and it's like, oh, like we're going to be talking for the next three hours now because yeah, that's just how it happens. That's yeah. how it works. That's great. Oh, fun. And where can people find you? Um, You can find me mostly on Twitter, which is I'm at L on words and L is spelled like the magazine E-L-L-E. I'm on there a lot. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and those you can find because they're much longer to say and they involve underscores. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can find on my website, which is just llmckinney.com. And I think it's in the upper right hand corner or if you scroll down or so, it's it's on there somewhere where you can find all of my social media including uh, I have a YouTube channel where I mostly just post where I used to get play of the game all the time Ooh. back during all my Overwatch days. Who knows if they Blizzard gets their mess together 
<laughs> and maybe we'll go- get back to that. But yeah, I'm mostly on Twitter. I'm kind of on it. I'm doing better with Instagram. I have debated getting the TikTok, but mm. that requires like effort. So <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Well, you can find me at Miss Old School. It's Old School with a K. And you can find the podcast at Mooney's Club on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening.